I think to many people, when you look at the natural world, plants just seem to be like a fuzzy green backdrop to the key protagonists, the animals. And you'd think that with all the money that Hollywood has, they wouldn't have the same attitude, but they absolutely do. What the hell is he thinking right now? I am the greatest botanist on this planet. As a botanist, here are some of the things that Hollywood films either get spectacularly wrong, but sometimes bang on the money about plants. Mud can be a little impetuous. Well, it's not the worst quality in the world. <laughs> to me, one of the biggest howlers that you'll see is in Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull. There's a chase scene where they're going right through the Amazon rainforest, probably somewhere like Peru or Bolivia, and the Jeep rams through an artichoke plant, and then it hits it again, and then you keep seeing the same artichoke plant. And when I say the same plant, I mean a cutout image from the same angle of the same plant repeatedly and all over the place. Artichokes are thistle plants from the barren regions of the Mediterranean. What on earth are they doing in tropical rainforest? But I'm not just talking about pedantic details of set dressing. It's often major plot points. So take The Martian, for example. Now, I'm already on Team Martian because the protagonist is a botanist. He's the hero of the film, and we always get overlooked. Luckily. I'm a botanist. A lot of the stuff is really, really legitimate. So potatoes are an amazing uh, and very plausible thing that you could grow in that environment because they produce huge amounts of calories for very small areas of land, one of the largest calories per square meters of any type of crop. They also require minimal processing, so all of that's legitimate. And what's even more legitimate is we now know that humans can live off very little else other than potatoes for up to two to three years at a stretch. They're a comparatively complete food, so they contain all sorts of micronutrients which other grains like rice or wheat don't necessarily have. So all of that's great. However, he gets the potatoes not from tissue samples or seeds that a botanist might have in his lab. He gets them shrink-wrapped and then goes to plant them. If a plant is shrink-wrapped, it has to be cooked because it can't respire without oxygen and carbon dioxide around them. So those potatoes are cooked and therefore dead tubers. There is no way he could have grown them from that packet. And you know what's so infuriating is they get 99% of the stuff really right, which Hollywood normally just doesn't bother with. And just to fall down on that tiny, tiny plot point, I mean, just hire a botanist. I'm available, Hollywood. Is this West Indian lilac? Yes. We know they're toxic, but the animals don't eat them. You sure? Pretty sure. I feel a little bit guilty about this one because it's my favorite film of all time. I'm a child of the 90s. So hero botanist Ellie Sattner finds a leaf while they're driving in a car, rips it off, and starts inspecting it. And later on in the film, she says, You have plants in this building that are poisonous. You pick them because they look good. But these are aggressive living things that have no idea what century they're in, and they'll defend themselves violently if necessary. How on earth does she know? Toxicity is really difficult to determine. And to do that, you actually have to attempt to poison someone with it. If you only know a plant from fossils, there is no way of determining its toxicity. No radio, no heat source. Nobody's home. There is nothing in the desert. One of the first scenes in Prometheus Alien lands on Earth and basically uh, sacrifices himself into a waterfall to seed the planet with DNA to create the first life on planet Earth. And what's kind of nuts about that is you can see in this massive drone shot that there's just acres and acres of fluorescent green moss underneath. A barren planet would have no moss on it whatsoever. It would have no green, at least living green on it. Um, I think that people just think when they see a scene like that, they think plants aren't alive, when the reality is plants are the foundation of every form of terrestrial life. I'm trying to understand this deep connection that people have to the forest. She talks about a network of energy that flows through all living things. She says, all energy is only borrowed, and one day you have to give it back. 
Sometimes when Hollywood gets things right, they can come in quite unexpected places. So there's a scene in the first film, quite close to the end, where uh, they connect with the roots of a sacred tree. And the idea is the planet is one continuous consciousness, all linked by this tree. Now that looks and sounds completely far-fetched, but we now know that trees actually communicate uh, with their young, they share sugars, they alert each other about environmental threats, and they can even change their behavior to respond to those threats through this constant network of communication, which largely happens underground and we can't see. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. Now, obviously, there's loads of poetic license in here because that's not how it actually works. It's not how it actually looks. But the philosophy, the underlying philosophy there isn't too bad. And that film came out pretty quickly after one of the first papers was published on that. So it made it from Scientific Journal into Hollywood film in a really quick space of time. So I think the moral of this story is never, ever go with a botanist to the cinema.